Hi, good evening, and thank you so much for tuning into I Stand with Zambia. We're live streaming today on Facebook and on YouTube. So we're so glad for those of you who are going to be joining us live and for those who are going to be joining in watching the um, the repeat of, of, of this, it's going to be worth it. Um, tonight, we are going to be discussing nationalism and the industrial revolution. And the the person who's going to be taking us through this, I'm going to read his profile, okay? Get ready for this. He was the former director of the projects for Indico and the general manager for Zambia Ceramics and Black Hood Lodge. He's the former cabinet minister of science, technology, and vocational training. He was twice elected the member of parliament for Mongu. He is the former chairman of the Economic Association of Zambia. He is the former chairman of the African Peer Review Mechanism in Zambia. He is the former managing director of the Tanzania Zambia Railway Authority, that's Tazara. And he, um, he, he, he holds three master's degrees from American universities um, he's the former advisor for the uh, SMH Rail of Malaysia, and he is the editor-in-chief of the Barotse National Library Documentary and Research Services. He is also an author, and he has close to a dozen books. My guest is Mr. Akashambatwa Mbikusita Lawanika, who I'm going to add to the stream. Thank you so much. Uh, such a pleasure to be welcomed on this program. It's such an honor to to have you on. And um, hold on, I'm just trying to get the layout here. Fine. There we go. It's such an it's such an honor to have you on. I've been following your work for a couple of months now, and it's totally changed my life. Yeah, I am in, almost in place. <laughs> <laughs> well, so let's just dive right into it. So uh, we are discussing nationalism and the Zambian revolution. So we're going to start with nationalism. Now, uh, my page is known as I Stand With Zambia on Facebook and YouTube. And I constantly get, um, I don't want to use the word attacked, but I'm constantly told that you're not really standing for Zambia. You obviously have a political affiliation. And I have to explain to the people that there isn't just two sides. There's not just a green and a red side. There is a Zambian side. And I represent the Zambian side. And my page represents that Zambian side. So um, can you tell us what nationalism is what is it to be a patriot what is the value of it and what does it look like in 2021 where like i said earlier you're either a green or a red you know what does being patriotic being a patriot look like in zambia what is the value of patriotism and what is it actually? Well, let's start with nationalism that you see the nation itself is uh, a society to which all nationals belong. So that everybody in, within the nation belongs to the nation. And uh -huh. therefore their, the pursuit of their interests is the guide to nationalism. In other words, nationalism is inclusive and it's not exclusive. Uh, political parties, and it's so good that they call them political parties. Yes. Using the word party meaning a part. So even by definition, and certainly in practice, there cannot be any political party 
to which all nationals belong. Yeah. So part is already a part of something. Even under the one party state, although the political slogans seem to indicate like all Zambians are members of that party, it was not true. It was never true. Mm -hmm. In fact, that the, the registered number of UNIP uh, members was usually 300,000, even when Zambia was 4 million, 7 million, and so on. So mm -hmm. at no time can a political party represent everybody. I was so glad this, e this evening I was listening back to Mandela's speeches. And I was fascinated that never quite caught it before, and I was so glad to catch it. When he says that even the African National Congress has never claimed to be the sole representative of That's South that. Africans. Of course, there have been African political parties, particularly freedom fighting independence parties, that have sought to present themselves as such. Swapu mm -hmm. in Namibia fought very hard to be recognized as the sole representative of, uh, of yeah. uh, the people of Namibia. But even that was never true. Uh, and of course, the one party state sought to present themselves as such. So a key to understanding nationalism, whatever you know which you do, which is nationalistic, must exclude nobody from the nation. And that is the challenge of nationalism. Uh, now, the other challenge of nationalism in the post-colonial uh, environment is that our countries themselves, post-colonial nation states, mm -hmm. are creations of colonialism. So you could even say they were given birth at Independence Day. That's when they were given their territories, they were given their constitution, they were given their group of Africans to call their own citizens. Uh -huh. So the challenge of nationalism under these circumstances is that day one of our independence should mm -hmm. have properly been seen as day one of starting to build the Zambian nation. Yes. In other words, a nation cannot be created by just changing flags or getting a seat at the UN. A nation is formed by by working on building a connection which includes all the nationals beyond party political line the challenges that you are given uh that people want you to choose sides yeah that they can be nobody who stands for the zambian nation is uh, is indicative the challenge is that all zambians must stand for the Zambian nation. Yes. Up and above their church affiliation, their political affiliation, Absolutely. their sports affiliation, and so on. But the reason you are challenged is because, in fact, the Zambian nation formation, national formation, has not gone very far. It perplexes me and really stresses me so much when i go to uh, a funeral service particularly yeah. if it is uh, of a, an important uh, former leader of the nation that even mm -hmm. in church they will have benches for the opposition leaders and government leaders now at funerals in churches and soccer stadiums these are opportunities we should take to be what we are, yeah. regardless of our religious and political affiliation, regardless right. of whether you are in government or, or outside government. Uh -huh. Unfortunately, because we haven't done that, we've brought partisan politics into absolutely everything. And therefore, people live in a society where partnership, partisanship is presented in every sector find it very difficult to believe that anybody can be above yeah. partisanship or that in other words if you are not with them you must be with the other party yes and uh, and uh, that that is a tragedy and that is the challenge so all of us not just yourself are challenged that in most 
human endeavors in most of our livelihood uh -huh. we should not be partisan we should only be partisan in affairs that are purely party politics yes and this this idea of failing to understand the inclusive the necessary inclusiveness in nationalism mm -hmm. leads to that even people think that the government itself belongs to the ruling party and that it is their government is the president's government is the ruling party's government and this is an indication of exactly how far we have not gone in building mm -hmm. true nationalism in our mm -hmm. governance system mm -hmm. How can a person to in in today's charged environment, what can a person adapt in order to be nationalistic? So let's say we have people who have chosen their political affiliations. How can they recognize whether their how can they be patriotic within their party? And how can they recognize whether th their choice of political party is patri is um, nationalistic? Well, in fact, you see, although the, the party belongs to just its members and therefore it's only a part, necessarily a part, uh, what those who form parties purport is to create a vehicle which may be partisan in the sense that not everybody is obliged to be members of it but whose programs and motivation is to serve the nation as a whole particularly if their program includes uh being given child of governance like standing for an election and becoming a ruling party what is called a ruling party uh, if that is part of their agenda then they must inherently understand that when they succeed in the agenda of becoming a ruling party, mm -hmm. they have obligation to serve the nation as a whole. And the institutions of government over which they have been given the privilege to lead in administering are national institutions at the service of all nationals, regardless of their party system. In other words, uh, citizens should be free to join to parties of their choice. But even in, in their activities in the party, they must have a framework which allows them to see the total picture of, uh, of the nation. So that uh, even when parties are competing, like we are about to get mm -hmm. into an electoral competition in Zambia, even when they are competing, they should actually be competing that our party promotes nationalism more than your party. Not that our party, once it wins, you are dead. That once it wins, we'll stop not saving you, those who didn't yeah. vote for us. That, that is the, the problem that uh, we need to rise up to that sort of uh, nationalism, which allows you that even as you act in a party, you are respectful of the interest of everybody else in the nation. Yes. Similarly, if you belong to a particular church or a particular religion, yes. you, have, you should be free to belong to a religion of your choice, a church of your soul choice. Indeed, yes. to, to, to act in accordance to your particular faith. Mm -hmm. But whatever you do in the name of faith, in the name of religion, in the name of a church, should not override the interest of others who don't belong to your church or That's to your right. religion or to your party. In fact, you should even fight for the rights of those who have chosen to belong to other churches to, mm -hmm. to exist. Yeah. Because the principle of freedom of religion the principle of freedom of uh, forming parties or joining parties mm -hmm. cannot stand in a regime 
which bans other people to have that freedom because today it may be your party yes which is allowed to exist but tables can change yeah can turn when the tables change you also be fighting for the freedom to belong to your party or belong to your church there is even yeah. a, a very illustrative case where from independence we had a state of emergency in addition to the state of emergency we continued with the colonial public orders act which is inherently suppressive of the right of people to belong to their uh, political parties or to exercise their freedom of association freedom of assembly and so on yes now so that throughout the 27 years rule of unique they upheld that law but when the tables turned the most illustrious challenge of the public orders act was led by unique leaders including uh, headed by uh, um, Mrs. Christine Mulundika. And there is even a historical case, the Mulundika yes. case, which they won. Yes. And it, it forced Parliament to change the Public Order Act, although it was yes. changed in bad faith because they purported to change it but reinstituted it. They put clauses like. Uh, uh, that if you want to meet, you have to notify. But in practice, yes. they, they, they actually think the police should give you permission to meet, which is not the spirit of the Supreme Court judgment that uh, basically criticized the Public Order Act. And unfortunately, that is the situation. The, what is being illustrated here is that those who thought the Public Order Act was in their favor, mm -hmm. soon realized that it, it is not guaranteed to be in your favor forever. You are better off living in a society without this Public Order Act, without suppression of freedom of people to associate uh, and so on, so that regardless of which party you will be in and whether the party you will be in will be a ruling party or not, in future, you are covered. Yeah. In other words, uh that is a lesson that uh, you pass there are many lessons like that actually in our history where people pass laws against others and they end up being victimized by those laws i'm not saying that you should do you should legislate good laws simply for fear that it may be your turn to be punished mm. you should actually legislate good laws because you are a good nationalist I want to go back to the uh, just the the Public Order Act. From what I read, it was a law that was created in, in in 1955, and it was so that the colonialists could monitor. Uh, uh, I don't want to call us Zambians because we weren't Zambians then, but Black Northern Rhodesians were not allowed to gather. Three or more people could not meet unless they had notified the police so as yes. you said the kaunda regime carried that over into when they were ruling and then when it came time for multi-party democracy to come that very law was being used against them and then yes. mrs malundika took it to court for an interpretation was she saying that is it right i, I think i i think i read where she was questioning it to say, should a law that was made before we became a country, be before we were our own country, should that law still be active today now that we are our own republic? Was that what it, what it was? Yeah, well, the, I think the legal question was that if you, the constitution of Zambia provides for freedom of association and freedom of assembly. Yeah. Now the, the, the the Public Order Act seeks to regulate that in a manner that actually curtails it. That is the fundamental contradiction. The moral contradiction is that we've, we fought, or let's say we meaning Africans, black Africans, yeah. or those who supported the cause of freedom, even if they were not black, yes. 
criticized the colonial system for not providing sufficient freedom to Africans. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Public Order Act was introduced just at the time when the, the Africans were now exercising a freedom of association and freedom of assembly, which was increasingly political, increasingly questioning the colonial regime, mm -hmm. and they wanted to, to suppress that. So that is its purpose. So I, the, the, the moral shame is that after independence, you continue to suppress your people. Then mm -hmm. even MMD, which fought against UNIT for precisely continuing with the colonial regime of suppression, when it was its turn to go to be governed, uh, it also continued with those rules, the Public Order Act. It even attempted to reinstitute the, the state of emergency. Now, the, the key thing is that, um, and that has continued up to date. Yes. So after MMD, when MMD was ruling using those colonial suppressive rules, uh, yes. parties like the PF suffered and talked against it. When yes. they got into power, they also continued with it. And uh, we are doomed to do that until we check. But what we have to realize, what is important to take note of, Yes. That while there is a choice whether or not people continue these rules, what is more fundamentally critical is to look at our constitutional regime, which basically facilitates yes. the ruling party to be able to have a free choice without consulting the people, whether to continue with suppressive laws or not. Yeah. So that it may not be enough, it may be necessary but not sufficient to ask yeah. ruling parties to cease continuing this regime. But what would be sufficient is to have a constitutional regime which does not facilitate it. Yeah, you've taken me back to that 1969 ref referendum <laughs> that yes. that took the power away from the people to have to be consulted to amend the constitution and put it in the hands of parliamentarians yes wow in, in fact mm -hmm. that i i'm of late i'm trying to focus people on that because really this is the identifiable point of departure towards the institutionalizing, constitutionalizing, and uh, acculturating the politics of suppression of freedoms of the people. And uh, the, in fact, during the freedom struggle, I always say this uh, just for historical record and to teach younger people. Yes that uh, when Congress was founded, it had two slogans, one man, one vote, and leadership through teamwork. When you need, of starting with Zambia African National Congress, ZANC, broke away from the African National Congress. And even before that in Congress, there was a, a slogan the shortcut, instead, they were not shouting, we want independence. They said, we want freedom. Hmm. We want freedom. Wow. Huh? Wow. So, so that basically the struggle for independence was a struggle promising that after independence, yes. there will be freedom. Yes. But if you continue the, the suppressive regimes that had suppressed freedom before independence, if you continue them after independence, then you won't even achieve meaningful freedom. No. Wow. <laughs> wow, that's really incredible. Wow. It's, it's, it's almost like 
today as an as a nationalist as a patriot of zambia it is our our responsibility and our role to demand that the constitution come back to the people that we should be the ones to be able to we should be consulted so that it's teamwork as you said leadership through teamwork so it's almost like that's what we need to do but i i know it, correct me if i'm wrong but the 2016 general election was run alongside the referendum and it was just terrible because it needed well, its own platform it needed its own space yeah. its own time well, what was wrong with it was that you see in other words the 69 referendum yes ended the, the need for referendum uh in most cases except with the bill of rights mm -hmm. so that the constitution has been molested in all parts leaving the bill of rights but if the rest of the constitution is inconsistent with those bill of rights in fact the the Mulundi, christine mulundika case was challenging that you see if you have laws like the public order act they are contradicting the bill of rights yeah so that even so that the referendum in 2016 i did not support it because it is part of the culture of piecemeal distortion of the constitution okay huh? and now that piecemeal was now trying to not to return the the powers to the people because okay. uh, it was made very very clear that the the actually very clearly articulated intention of the 69 referendum articulated by president kaunda himself was that they wanted uh, they were bothered and they did not like the obligation yes. of having to consult the people each time they wanted to change the constitution and that was said just like that yeah. so it is so incredible that people can be told that we want you to vote yes to this proposal to end referendum because we don't want the obligation to be consulting you each time we change mm. we want to be able to change the constitution simply for the constitution to be changed which means actually for the constitution to be made and re remade by your representatives in parliament without yes. consulting you now when when they are campaigning for you to send them to parliament they did not go there that we are going to change the constitution this and this so that when you give them the mandate it is included when they are campaigning they say we'll build you roads we'll build you school then when yeah. they go to parliament they grant themselves the power to change the constitution which should be the mother of all laws it should be the foundation of the society we are talking about nationalism it should be the embodiment of a, a, a friendly environment for nationalism to thrive, for mm -hmm. inclusiveness to thrive. Mm -hmm. It should not be a partisan document. And we know from the very beginning that our parliament has always been partisan. It is possible in some constitution, in some uh, government system, where they have a practice that when it comes to real national issues yeah. or moral issues or constitutional issues then even though parliament may vote on them then they take away the the whip in other words then individual members of parliament are free to vote according to their conscience mm -hmm. but in zambian political culture there is no such thing yeah if you go to parliament you are not even representing your people you are representing your party and you are guided by your party you are threatened by your party if you don't agree with your party 
uh, you'll be kicked out yes. of the party. If you are kicked out of the party, they've already even indicated, made new rules, post-independence rules, which say if your party rejects you, you lose your seat. In other words, they reinforce partisanship rather than reinforce nationalism. Wow. Well, sticking with the uh, the theme of nationalism, the Zambia Industrial, um, the in, sorry, Industrial Development Corporation spearheaded the beginning of what I call the Zambia Industrial Revolution. And you were the director of projects in the Industrial Development Cooperation, which is known as Indico. And this drove the heart of the economy of Zambia. I have um, uh, nostalgic uh, memories uh, and just from what I've heard that those were the days in Zambia was was Zambia when when workers had jobs and their uh, salaries were guaranteed and every province had a particular uh, industrial sector. You were the director of projects in Indico, what was the what what was the aim? What what was the narrative for Indico? Well, to start with, the, the we talk about the independence movement, the movement to demand the independence of the country, which was most articulated in political terms, but it was also articulated in economic terms. Yeah. So that uh, although sometimes the economic narrative took a backseat to the political narrative, but it was always there. In any case, the same people who founded the trade union movement, which is a, an economic association, are also the same people who founded the political movement. Yes. And so that from the very beginning, the welfare, and then it is illustrative that before political parties were formed, the associations Africans had was on African welfare, which is basically tied to the economics of it. So that part of the criticism of colonialism was its uh, insufficient industrialization, insufficient okay. economic uh, development, the, the lack of development spread, that it was standard uh, state of affairs in all colonies, not just in Africa, in Asia, and so on, that at independence countries inherited what was called a dual economy, with one part of the economy which is quite modern, and another part of the economy which is basically neglected. And uh, the, the development of this uh, modern economy sabotages and leads to further underdevelopment of the neglected part of the, the economy. So that the challenge and then the other characteristic was that this modern economy mm -hmm. was dominated by European settler owned or European yes. foreign European owned industries, yes. mines and industries, and even the big farms where yes. European settlers, the, 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 uh, several years after independence, the majority of commercial farmers remained as European settlers. So the economy had this, this race issue, as mm. well as this geographical problem of not having spread. So the, the challenge after independence was to find a vehicle which could address these issues. Yes, and the Indico, which had existed before, as uh, before colonial, before independence, in northern Rhodesia. Okay, but but it was for the purpose of facilitating newly recruited immigrants from Europe and uh, and non-African countries. All right, so that when they come in, they are facilitated to go into industry. So they would, they would be directed, because after World War II, many of the returning British soldiers, for instance, to England, there were no jobs in England. So there was a mission to send them to the colonies mm. and settle them. 
Okay. So for so that the 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 the, the function of the pre pre independence industrial development cooperation was ratio in the sense that it was focused not helping everybody to industrialize yeah. but yeah. helping european settlers to 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 have a good industrial base here in other words perpetuating the racial character yes of the modern part of the economy a dual a dual economy so the challenge after independence was that to take this indigo and transform it into an uh, an agent which could take development to other parts of the country other than the line of railroad which could also bring uh, non-european indigenous africans into economic activities and uh, lead to a state where zambia actually owns its economy as opposed to what the case uh, before. Now, that, that was the challenge and that was the stated intention. Yes. But in practice... Uh, Sir, just, just for the sake of the people watching, they might not know what projects you worked on. So, for example, Monsa Batteries. Can you name some of the ones that you actually yes, worked on? I, I, I joined Indico in 1975 at Indico Milling as a deputy general manager for about six months, then was transferred to Osaka as a deputy general manager for national milling, then transferred to the Indico uh, Central in a group management uh, services division, which included project development uh maybe 1977 or so okay so i started as a senior project officer uh, which was actually a demotion in status from what i was as deputy general manager in uh, in uh, national milling and indico milling as you know i had a friend of mine who told me that it's better to be president of little Burundi than to be vice president of the united states <laughs> so, so when I went to Indico, I was in, in the two companies I started with, I was number two. When I went to Indico, I was maybe at the fourth level below and there were many other people. Yeah. But I rose from there to be manager development services, which was concentrating on industrial development, then actually became controller of group management services. When it was split, I became group director for industrial development. This is really at the tail end of Indico, uh, yes. from uh, 77 to 83, 84, when I went to Kitwe as general manager for Zambia Ceramics, which was one of the projects that I'd worked on before. But all in all, I worked in, apart from Mansa batteries and uh, Sparta bicycle, which I mention often because they make it clear what the shortcomings are of the type of industrialization we were undertaking. But I also worked on, uh, when I was at in Indico Milling, we set up the Mungu Mill, set up the Kavompo Maze Mill. And when I was at National Milling, uh we expanded the mill the wheat mill in Kabwe, and when i became a director of project actually i was transferred specifically okay to manage the choma milling project mm -hmm. because the choma milling project had been a national milling project but at that time national milling had been only privatized up to 51 percent it was 51 percent state 49 percent anglo-americans so okay. the board was composed of those and the board and uh, with the voice of uh, anglo-american very strong was demanding freedom to increase the price of milk and they they were now threatening that if you don't allow us to increase the price of milk, milk 
we will not build the Choma Mesme. So I was transferred by, by the state to Indico with that project to say, okay, it's like calling them BRAF. That, okay, so the project will go to Indico. So I went to my first project was Choma Mesme. Wow. Uh, and then uh, in addition to that, we had other mills expanded or built up. There were small maize mills in uh, Chelenje, in Chinsali, in Solwezi, and many other parts of Zambia, which are where. Then uh, also the intravenous fluid uh, project in Kawe. Also the, the, the Mulungushi textile actually was under me from at the beginning. Okay. Except I know you are very interested in our relationship with the Chinese. Uh, I had I had gone to China in the delegation of President Kaunda mm -hmm. when the support for the Mulungushi textile was made. And uh, so it started off as an Indico project. Now, the Indico projects division was a very professional, we could say professional capitalist culturally capitalist entity. So our approach to project implementation mm -hmm. was very specific and very professional. Now, when we were now dealing to cooperate with the Chinese, who had a different culture of cooperation, uh, when we asked for certain information, uh, they, they resented that. And it turned out that in the Tazara agreement, there were also certain obligation and licenses to build certain industrial or, or engage in commercial activities that will kind of provide the local currency required to build Tazara. As you know, the Chinese brought equipment, they brought personnel, yes. and uh, they didn't bring dollars and they didn't bring quachas. So there had to be a mechanism of how to finance the quacha costs. Okay. So it, as we were arguing with the Chinese, they kept reporting me particularly to the powers that be. Uh, I remember being called to Mr. Mdenda's office when he was prime minister and asked to stop, uh, to start cooperating with our friends. And I explained that, you see, we are just asking that, you know, we have to have a framework. How do we build this company? Uh, where does the machinery come from? When does it come? And so on and so forth. And our friends are not forthcoming. And in those days, it's not like the Chinese we are dealing with now. Who, okay. even if there are 10 of them, they all speak English. In those days, I would have 20 Chinese in my office. Only one would be an interpreter and the speaker will be in Chinese, the others will just be in the hall. So when you disagree, they would go now to the powers that be. So because of, uh, Indico and perhaps myself uh, didn't seem to be cooperative, the government transferred the project from Indico to the Ministry of Defense, which then licensed the Chinese to build it how they knew best with minimal questioning, minimal interference from any Zambian authority. So they didn't that, want you to know how they were doing it. They just wanted you to let them do it. Yes. Eesh. And okay. then uh, because it turned out, as I said, somehow uh, there, there had been another agreement, which Indica was not party of, but which was government to government which uh, said that the Chinese would bring the equipment, the build the, the equipment up to Dar es Salaam, then the Zambian party will pay for transporting it from Dar es Salaam to, to Kabwe. And uh, so the Chinese were coming to my office to demand the financing of that part, but we did not have a copy of that agreement. And even the prime minister failed to give us a copy of it. 
So rather than continue hugging with us, they took the project to the Ministry of Defense. So that is another project that uh, that, uh, that that I was in, I was involved in. When I was involved, there was no province which did not have a project. If, yeah, if more than two projects. Yeah, and that that to me, you know, is part of this. Um, when I when I read about how Zambia was before you know, every province was taken care of. There was something there for everybody. And that's, that there was a, there was a, there was a patriotic duty to make sure that our country was producing on every corner, Northeast, Southwest and Central. It's very yeah. different to development today. People think development is when you're building a a, a, a pyramid, a pyramid a ramp. in Osaka. Uh, yeah, when you're building a ramp, <laughs> um, yeah. that is okay. No, or... but, uh, but still we need to interrogate the type. I mean, it was the intentions were very, very good. The challenge was clearly understood, and the intention to meet this challenge was also quite clear, uh, which probably helped to speed up trying to implement it. But but not enough interrogation of the system was made. In other words, we wanted to do all those, all these things, to take industry out beyond the line of rail, to take industry in every province, uh, and to start import substitution. But within the same colonial capitalist framework of, of business, mm -hmm which inherently uh, is quite resistant to that. So that is part of the problem that we did not change the system. Yeah. We thought you could just do, do things within the same system, uh, but do them better or do them more of them. But as long as it's the same system, what this system meant was, is that its characteristics were not dependent. In other words, the machinery had to come overseas, the key personnel had to come from overseas, the markets had to come from, had to come, in the case of copper, had to be outside. Yeah. Now, it meant that if you take our mining industry, that even when we nationalized it uh, under the same system, it means that when there is a crisis in the global system, which controls both our export and imports, yes. we suffer. As they say, if, 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 they catch a, if they catch a cold in London, we are the one who, yeah. who, who have the symptom. So that by within the first 10 years of independence, there was a crisis in the global economy to which we depended. Yeah. Uh, in terms of copper prices going copper down, price. oil yeah. prices going down, and so on. That is a well told story. But yeah. you see, it is not an accident. In other words, the copper prices inherently keep going up and down, and oil prices keep going up and down. Mm -hmm. And when the, the Middle East and other major oil producers, because the prices dictated were high prices and we had no control over that we had no control over our copper prices going down we had no control over import prices costs going up so yeah. that inherent fault line that we build an economy which is inherently dependent and which is inherently not very well linked to the rest was one of the problems that ultimately it could not succeed. Even when you nationalize it, it doesn't change. When you later on we privatized it, it still doesn't change. Yeah. But uh, talking about Indico, Indico became, of course, our major vehicle for nationalization. Now, yeah. many companies other than mines, which were nationalized, came to be subsidiaries of Indeco. Mm -hmm. 
so that it was very much involved in the the nationalization but beyond taking on subsidiaries from nationalized industry we also uh took on uh, am i still on yes okay we also started new industries ourselves and these industries were modeled after import substitution because after we faced that crisis it was actually a foreign exchange crisis mm -hmm. so we had to try to reduce on the on uh, imports by building unfortunately with import substitution you don't completely divorce yourself from uh, from needing forex yes because the inputs to those industries even those we are making local also needs forex and uh, so that in the end both nationalizing industries and also bringing in import substitution industry we are not long-term solutions okay and it meant that even when you physically take an industry to the rural areas to every province they you translate you transfer them there with the same inherent weaknesses of being dependent and on forex being dependent on uh, on that sort of thing and therefore in the early years it looked as if we were making progress yes added to the fact that the population was small so that those who were graduating even just finishing primary school you could readily find a job those who left a junior secondary school found a job those who left a secondary school found a job yes. those who graduated found a job uh, these days, people are nostalgic about free education, being educated up to university level. Yeah. Now, the other side of that was that you were bonded, that after you graduate, you have to work for government. Oh, yes. That yes. Now, in the early days when there were other jobs, students who hated being bonded, I'm sure if you introduce bonding now, People will be so happy because they can't find jobs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so that the, the the fact that the population was small and you can absorb those who are coming into the labor force uh, was uh, quite helpful in in painting these nice pictures of people have of the early independence days. Furthermore, we were assisted that the damage to the rural sector had not completely set in so that the people in the rural areas were by and large able to feed themselves most years now gradually they are not able to do that so that they all now need to be fed on this narrow uh dependent economic system so that is really the that is the the challenge of uh, of indico so in the early days nationalizing creating new industry seems to work but once we hit the reality that this was dependent development mm -hmm. and once we accepted the assistance of the world bank and the imf mm -hmm. who thought that this problem or acted as if this problem was a temporal problem rather than an, a structural problem Mm -hmm. uh, so they thought that it's a temporal problem, which is a bridging finance, that for the time being, our import bill is larger than our export earnings. So if we are given a loan to bridge that gap, when the economy normalizes, we will normalize. Now, the yeah. economy never normalized. From 73 up to 1991 or two. Mm -hmm. the economy was in regression yes and the loans were mounting and that's what led us to the status from being a middle income country at independence to one of the highly indebted poor countries in the world needing debt forgiveness 
Yeah. Not out of the charity of those we owed money, but out of the realism that we can, it's what Fidel Castro said, it was mathematically unrepayable. Speaking of that, keeping in that line of thought, the so you mentioned Tazara and you mentioned Mulingushi textiles. So these were one of, because at that time, China was a poor country. It wasn't what it is today. So I know that yes. Tazara was the first, was the maiden foreign project that China ever did. Uh, but in the, in, the, then, in the whole of Africa. In the whole of and Africa. And that now is the largest invest, foreign investment ever. Yes. And I was watching and a video. Which is understandable if you compare a stadium to a railway line. <laughs> yeah. Yes. The yes. The significance, everything is very, it's, it's very, very different. I remember watching a video that Kaunda, somebody, I think it was Ian Smith was telling Kaunda. He was saying to him, You're dealing with communists. They're gonna take over your country. And then Kaunda said, "All they're, the only thing they're doing here is building roads and helping us with the, with the rail and Mulungushi. They will never interfere in our governance. But that's different to the way things are today. Today, um, going, if, you, if you go on the Exim Bank of China website, Export Import Bank of China website, they list mm -hmm. as um, their assets as Zesco, ZNBC, and the KK International Airport, amongst other things. These belong to the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party. Exim Bank of China yes. lists their assets. This is mm -hmm. not, how is it that Kaunda, you, it, when, when, when you were the ones um, leading, you did not give them, you, we, they never owned anything. They just did the work. How is it that yes. we have found ourselves? I mean, I know about the Belt and Road Initiative that China's got all over the world, but what is it about you guys then and the people who are ruling now that now these assets belong to China? We are, we are actually the same. Uh, you see, uh, Martin Luther King said, nobody can climb on your back unless you bend it. Okay. So that blaming a, a back climber without you paying attention to the one who's back bending. The Africans are bending their backs. But let me go from yes. the beginning of our relationship with China. Okay. Uh, first and foremost, the Zambian governments very passionately preferred mode of financing the railway to Tanzania was to Western countries. So they did go to the World Bank. They did go to Britain. They did go to, uh, to America. They did go to Canada. Those were Zambia's preferred financiers. But they got a negative response. Yeah. The Americans' response was that, well, we can help you build a road, but not a railway. The railway is not economic. Okay. So, in fact, Zambia relating to the Chinese over the railway was a second option after the first option was uh, negated. Okay. Uh, and historically, it is the Tanzanians on behalf of Zambia and Tanzania who initiated the contact with uh, China. Uh, and I have that from very good uh, authority of, uh, Abra, of uh, Mohammed Babu, who was uh, at the time Minister of Economic Development in Tanzania. Okay. Mohammed Babu was one of our truly revolutionary. He was a Zanzibari revolutionary. In fact, there's a nice picture of him meeting Malcolm X in Tanzania when Malcolm X came. He also mm -hmm. met Che Guevara. So he was a thorough revolutionary. Mm -hmm. The Zanzibar revolution 
which was uh, basically taking away the government from what was regarded as Arab hands mm -hmm. to more African bands. He was part of that movement. The first country to recognize Zanzibar after the revolution were the Chinese, followed by the East Germans. Okay. So Muhammad Babu, as a leader of the revolutionary, or one of the leaders of the Zanzibar revolutionary, was very familiar with the Chinese. In fact, in 1964, when Tanzania and, uh, Tan and Zanzibar went into a union, he was not part of the negotiation. He told me that he was actually in China, okay. representing Zanzibar, when his Chinese hosts informed him that your country has been swallowed up by Tanganyika. So when he came back from there, uh, he was appointed Minister of Economic Development in, in the new union, the Tanzania. Okay. So when the Nyerere's were trying to assist Zambia to get out, they were the first to, to turn their backs on those who had turned their backs on us, the Western countries. Yeah. So, so President Nyerere sent Mohammed Babu to China and he met Mao Zedong and started initiating probing the possibility of China coming to the aid of Zambia and Tanzania to build those railways. And uh, when he came back with Nyerere's, uh, in, got an indication that the Chinese were quite interested, that is when the Tanzania now engaged their, their colleagues in Zambia. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, they convinced the Zambians to also abandon praying to these Westerners who were determined not to assist us. Yeah. What is most important about our relationship with China, starting from that, yes. was that it was at our request. So that in 1967 now, uh, the loan to Zambia and Tanzania to build this railway was signed. And the construction started in 1970. It finished in 1975. Yes. And commercial operations started in 1976. Uh, it is very interesting that if you read Julius Nyerere's book, Ujama, one of the, he has several books in there. There is uh -huh. a speech he made at the opening of Tazara, uh -huh. which said the same thing as the Kaunda statement at the same function. Uh -huh. of, and the points both presidents made was that this railway is ours. Yes. The Chinese are merely assisting us yes. with loans. That ultimately it's our responsibility that's right. And they underlined the fact that the agreement was that there will be a moratorium on debt repayment of 10 years after commercial operation, but that after 1986, we were supposed to start repaying that. If we had done that, our relationship with China would have been man to man of, okay. of equal partners. Okay. But we didn't pay. We didn't pay a penny. Mm -hmm. Instead, we are we again asked the Chinese to assist us. So they gave us a second loan in 86. Between 1986 to date, they, we've asked or we have signed six at least 16 loans from the Chinese without starting to repay it. Any of them. And instead of starting to repay it in the 1990s, 90, the end of the 1990s, we yes. started saying, since the Westerners have forgiven us our debt, can you also forgive us our debt? They took many, many years to forgive our debt. And when they decided to forgive the debt, they said they are forgiving 50% of the original loan. OK. Now, the original loan was at five, $500 million. 
So you can imagine how shameful, how irresponsible it is for two African countries to fail to even begin repaying what amounts to 200 and 70 something million dollars huh? hmm. for each, but rather beg them to for more. forgive our debt. So that, you see, if this is what I mean, that Martin Luther King was correct. Nobody will climb on your back unless you bend unless it. You bend them. Yeah. And if you don't pay your debt, your creditors will dictate. That's why the Westerners dictate to us. Yeah. Because we borrow euro bonds, we borrow money from them. And at first, they may even be the ones suggesting that your solution is to borrow like they did in 73. But after a little while, you get hooked to borrowing. So I'm and just going to get start my charger. Pay, Sir, I'm just going to get my charger. Just two seconds. Okay. Thank you. My phone is about to go off. Those are real two seconds. Good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So once you are, in other words, both with the Western countries and with the Chinese, the problem is ours. Yes. We are the one acting like children. We are the one thriving on a culture of being dependent. Yes. We, we are acting as if it is normal, decade after decade, to live in a world where a few people are donors and we belong to the main, many people who are recipients. And we yes. think it's normal. That is why even a low-ranking European diplomat in Lusaka can poke his nose in anything going on in Zambia. They, they can even start micromanaging the economic management and the political dispensation in Zambia because we have allowed ourselves to be children in the world, despite our fight, people having died for Africa to be truly independent yeah. and for African people in African independent countries to be to be free. Wow. Well, as we're um in the dying five minutes of this, in what you've said, what can a person now who's listened to this message, they understand what they need to be as a patriot. What is the patriotic response to reclaiming and revamping the Zambian industrial sector, our economy? Like, you know, you said that Martin Luther King said, if somebody can only jump on your back if you bend over. So what is the patriots response in 2021 as we move into potentially, well, as we move into having a new administration in the next couple of months, what can somebody who is saying, okay, I've listened to this message. I now want to look at Zambia through patriotic eyes. What should they be saying about this? In you know, how, yeah. what, you, what you've just said. Yeah, I think it's, we, we've already hinted at this, that in yeah. the beginning, it was very clear what our challenge and our mission should be. Apart from genuine independence, it included economic independence. Yeah. Indeed, when the nationalization was taking place, it was said that this is now us taking the step towards economic independence. But unfortunately, like our political independence, we think that day one of our, our independence, once we put up our flag on day one, we think we've already achieved the political independence. We will think we've already formed a nation. It's the same with the economy, that the minute you nationalize, you declare that now Zambia is ours. When the system you are operating, even the nationalists, yeah. the nationalized industry, is actually not yours. It doesn't, it was not structured by you, it was not built for you. Yeah. And it can never work for you. Yeah. So that in terms of nationalism, which you, what you are calling patriotism, 
but it's better to call it nationalism because that makes it very easy to understand that one we have said that true nationalism must be inclusive okay uh, uh, and true nationalism must lead to independence of the nation because to have a nation which is dependent on others yeah is really to negate the nationalism because yes. the nationalism means being in charge of our economy and our governance because colonialism meant two things to take away power of self-governance political independence mm -hmm. and take away power over our land and natural resources economic command yes so that decolonization must address these issues and must address them radically and from the root the root of them that's right the lesson from our history is that even when we had good intention our actions itself did not go deep enough yeah to address the root causes of our problem that's right we were happy to just you know go on a at, at Matero on a hill before the stadium was built and count to tell the masses that now we have nationalized mm -hmm. and because we have nationalized Zambia is ours. We didn't do go beyond those ways. Yeah. And it's the same with independence that we have a new flag, we have a seat at, at the UN uh, and uh, we immediately align ourselves to be tutored by yeah. those we said we are trying to be independent from so that i think the, the let me say that the short of my message is that let us please re-examine the roots of our independence struggle yeah what was intended yes that's right and what we have done even when we mean well is not good enough now we are not just doing things that are not good enough we are even doing evil things which are yes. directly even intended to do harm to the to the project of nation building sir i am so glad that you came on today can you share your email address with give people your contact details on how they can get in touch with you because i'm sure a lot of people would want to talk to you after this i'll tell them to go through miss monsa <laughs> <laughs> okay you heard it folks. okay my, my 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 email is akaliwanika2 at gmail.com akaliwanika2 at gmail.com okay okay yeah. i'm just gonna read uh, a comment here from emma katz she says let's examine the roots of our independence wow and then she says thank you sir i thank her <laughs> <laughs> okay everyone thank you thank you thank you so much mr Aka, i'm gonna take you off but please don't log out Okay. 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 Thank you very much, and uh, for this opportunity, it's I'm dying awesome. to share. I can't share enough, and I I blame myself for not having shared enough in the past. And now I'm running out again. of time. <laughs> We're gonna have you back on again for sure. Okay. Okay, everybody, thank you so much again for uh, tuning into I Stand With Zambia. We're on YouTube, we're on Facebook, and I'm so glad for those of you who have stuck in and watched and those who are gonna watch later on. Um, this is it, you know, uh, we have to put our country first. We have to understand our country and, and uh, that's gonna help us to make better informed decisions going forward. We know, um, who we're meant to support, who, 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 who we cannot support for national, for, for nationalistic reasons. So let's put the nation first. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and we'll see you again. And we're definitely going to have 
Mr. Akashambatwa and Bikusita back on again on I Stand with Zambia. Again, this, this, uh, this platform has no political affiliation, but it is 100% affiliated with being a Zambian. Thank you so much and good day.